This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The historic second impeachment of Donald J. Trump continues to be a divisive force in politics. Representative Tom Cole Chickasaw voted against the recognition of the election results in Arizona, and he now says that impeachment will not help the country heal. However, other Republicans, including some in leadership, say that impeachment is necessary because of the Capitol attack last week. All of the indigenous Democrats in Congress support the removal of the president and a sanction that would prevent him from ever running for office again. The U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear a case that centers on tribe share of $8 billion in federal coronavirus relief. Lower court split on whether Alaska Native Corporation should be in the mix. And a federal appeals court ruled in September the corporations are not eligible. The Treasury Department says if that decision stands, the corporations will lose out on hundreds of millions of dollars in funding. They will also be deprived of their ability to help Alaska Natives when it comes to health care, education, and economic well-being. A key question is whether the corporations are considered tribes under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. The root of this issue goes back 50 years when Congress enacted the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. That law shifted the balance from tribes to regional corporations. Since then, many Alaska villages have received recognition from the United States as tribal governments. The case will be argued in the upcoming spring or fall session. Indigenous tribes in Brazil's Amazon rainforest are at a state of emergency because the infection rate is rising there. Medical teams traveled to Manaus, the heart of the Amazon rainforest, to treat the Piratupia indigenous community. Non-governmental organizations are scrambling to test as many people as possible to see what the infection rate is for a tribe in a remote part of the country. Recently, eight cases were discovered there. The community is about 30 miles deep in the rainforest. Medical experts worry the virus is spreading to even more remote regions in the jungle. This is an issue because there are few, if any, medical re facilities in the region. Pedro de Jesus de Silva says the distance is far, which makes the treatment difficult. We have a lot of difficulty, even to be locomoved here it's hard to even get to the city from here so far from medical facilities. It's really hard, and sometimes you have to make more than one trip. We have to do it more than once because there is no other way to treat these people. Health officials hope their tests will identify hotspots so their communities can be quarantined and protect other tribal communities from getting the coronavirus. High school prom is one of the most important events in a teenager's life. Choctaw citizen Isabel Cornell of Oklahoma City saw a way to highlight missing and murdered indigenous women. Cornell says that she wanted to make a statement about the ongoing indigenous crisis. So for her, prom in 2018, Cornell chose a custom-made dress made by a crow designer, Della Big Hair Stump of Hardin, Montana. The dress choice made national headlines. The Smithsonian National Museum of American in History is including the gown in a new exhibit called Girlhood. The dress is a centerpiece of an exhibit dedicated to the 100th anniversary of the women's rights movement. It will then tour the country through the Smithsonian's traveling exhibition through 2023 through 2025. HarperCollins is announcing it will launch a new line of books with a native focus. The line is called Heart Drum, and it's being developed in partnership with Cynthia Letich Smith. Smith is an award-winning and New York Times best-selling author. She's from the Muscogee Creek Nation. Heart Drum will offer a wide range of stories by Native authors. The line will offer everything from picture books, teen novels, nonfiction, and even graphic novels. Stories will be set in present day on the strength of young Native heroes. The name Heart Drum and logo pay tribute to the connection between the drumbeat and the heartbeat. The new line of books will be out next winter. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahan. We'll be right back.
Land is the greatest resource for tribal nations across the country. Some 56 million acres are held in trust by the federal government for tribes. That's about 2% of the country. While 90 million acres were taken by the U.S. between 1887 and 1934, tribes all over the country are reclaiming some of that land, lands that were lost. Joining us today are representatives from two tribes who are doing just that. Leroy Fairbanks from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota and Coco Hufford from the Confederate, Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Oregon. And Chris Stainbrook, president of the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, who helps facilitate some of these land transfers. Welcome. Leroy, let's start with you. Uh, tell us about the congressional action that was recently signed by the president. Buju, um, thanks for having me. <clears throat> Um, I was uh, elected to office in 2012, and upon getting in office, um, you kind of learn about some of the existing efforts that are going on, and I heard about this this issue, and it just seemed like a, a no-brainer um, of an issue that we needed to take up and prioritize, and so for the last eight years, it's been a rigorous effort uh, of many in, in kind of uh, complementing all the work that was done prior to but it was it was uh it, it's called the leech lake reservation restoration act and what it did was return 11,760 acres of um it, it's chippewa national forest is what the national forest we have on leech lake so it was in the united states department of agriculture and it's transferring over to um back to the department of interior and so it's just kind of reversing what was done in 19 in the uh, early 1940s to mid 1950s and so at that time there's a there's a process called a secretarial transfer where secretaries transfer um title from from one one uh, agency to another and it was illegally done and so they were not getting uh, permission of the allottees or the heirs of this of these of these lands and this property and um you know it was happening and, and it happened for for so long and then uh, it ended in it ended in the mid 1950s, and so here we are, 60, 70 years later, kind of correcting some of these historical wrongs that were happening. And um, you know, for many that know the the land issues in and around Leech Lake or Northern Minnesota tribes, it was a an effort by uh, timber barons in getting access and, and taking down the beautiful trees and forests that we have here. And so. Um, that that's kind of the, the 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 gist of it we had some traction that was um we got through the house and failed in the senate uh in the last congress and then we um <clears throat> had to start back over and in the last two years we we got the bill approved uh in december of 2020 and got the bill signed right before uh the end of 2020 so you know if we didn't get that um bill uh, across the finish line again this past December, we would have to start back over again in January, but it's a it, it's been a lot of work for many, many years on uh, people and our band members, our, our tribal leaders and efforts from from Leech Lake for many years. And so it's it's a pretty impactful day at Leech Lake and in, in getting that return. And so we have 800 over 850,000 acres as uh, our exterior boundaries and about over 40 percent of that is waterways. So lakes, rivers, streams and wetlands. Um, and we, we, we've had struggles with, you know, when, when, a, when a tribal member wants an, a home site lease, we're running out of those areas that we have, you know, so we've amped up efforts in the last eight years as well. We've purchased over or close to 3,000 acres of land um, in kind of in our strategy of land reacquisition planning. So the efforts are there, you know, in the last eight years, we're talking, and, and when you're thinking 850,000 acres, 15,000 acres does not seem like a lot, but 15,000 acres is a lot um, right. to people who've seen the limited access, the limited amount of, of, of land opportunities for tribal members, for housing, for business, for economic, for agriculture, for whatever uses they are. So um, we're, everyone's pretty excited about that uh, here at Leech Lake and across Indian country too. Thank you. Coco, how is this different from Umatilla's experience with land return? Well, Umatilla has a, a, a multiple approach for land acquisition. First, you know, first what we have done is that we've established an inheritance code, which allow, which has been adopted, you know, and approved at the BIA level 
which allows us to do to purchase from those that are not enrolled here. And this is something that was started in 1998 and then re-established in 2008 with, a, with an amendment. And then what we do with the not only the inheritance code, we we try to, you know, and Chris and, and Indian Land Tenure Foundation has been supportive is that we do um, <laughs> estate planning, will writing, gift deeds. And then what we have is the next component is we have a, a land acquisition strategy, which which because we had progressive um, board of trustees members who thought ahead, leadership that thought ahead, we, we decided that because of our checkerboard situation, because of the Allotment Act, that we needed to buy those, those parcels that we didn't own, not only by non-Indians, but Indians from other reservations. And then our other, other approach has been because of the land buyback program, Department of Interior's program, them coming in and assisting us in, you know, in 2015 and 2018. We continue to um, act, act, actively um, you know, go out and look for properties and establish criteria every year for what we need and where we wanna go with it. Um, so it's, it's a multiple approach. And, and it's um, an approach that we take um, and our board approves every year and provides us, our board of trustees provides us money uh, up to a million dollars, million plus every year to be able to do this acquisition process. So that's been our approach right now. Thank you. Chris, uh, what's the big picture here throughout Indian country? Well, I mean, there has been a major push over the last 20 years to really reacquire land that was alienated, particularly on reservation, but also the cultural sites. And, and we really saw that ramping up um, in the last few years as the tribes have had more resources, both from gaming and from um, the land buyback program that Coco mentioned, uh, those, those lands get leased and those revenues come into the tribal coffers and there's more land, more, more capital available for acquiring land. The other thing we've seen is non-Indians beginning to take an interest in returning land to Indian people and the tribes. And we see various contributions of land not always big tracts of land, but important tracts of land. So cultural sites, um, some of the religious sites that the tribes still hold an interest in. At the same time, there are pressures and particularly now that we've had the virus around Indian country, um, those pressures have kind of um, slowed the progress, if you will, but we still see it going on. Um, we see pressures on some of the religious institutions to return the land on reservations that they were given um, early on. And um, I think it's important that examples like Umatilla and Leech Lake are out there so people can see that it's not, it's not howling at the moon, it's actually happening. And you just have to put a plan together and, and move forward. It. I understand the churches have been very involved. The Methodist Church recently returned land and Roger Welsh gave his land back to the Pawnee when he found out that it was part of traditional lands in Nebraska. Um, how are these kind of things, uh, what kind of, are we getting stories about these? Yeah, that we, we're working with a village in Alaska right now, Taslina, that's um, trying to get land back from the Catholic Church. It was a boarding school for a long time. It was a polluted site and the Catholic Church was forced to clean it up and um, they would like to get paid at least the amount of cleanup that they did. We see those types of things. We see counties and cities starting to say, perhaps, you know, we should return this land. Um, in 2008, we helped a county and in Washington state, give a county park to a tribe. The tribe didn't have the funds to really maintain the park. <laughs> and so we bought them a pickup truck and a lawnmower and um, they've, they got the land back in tribal ownership and they've done well with it. But we're seeing that across the board. I know one of the uh, problems with this is that just getting the land back doesn't help with the status of the land. It doesn't automatically go into trust, for example. How does that process work? Not well. <laughs> Long and short of it. Um, 
and it varies by administration. And this last administration, putting land into trust was really difficult. And um, the Obama administration made it easier, but at the same time, um, I mean, if the foundation, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation would prefer that we have tribal nation status land where a tribe or individual tribal members own land, it's immediately in tribal nation status and under the jurisdiction of the tribe and not the state and county. But that's that's a whole nother step away. Coco, so much of the land has spiritual and cultural significance. How does the tribe look at it when they try to acquire those particular lands? Well, you know, most of this is done based upon what our cultural resource program wants us to to target. And, you know, because of the confidentiality matters about what 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 the sites are that were protected, if you know, we try to do it quietly and not not allow people knowing knowing that we need to go out there and acquire that property. But that's that's at the top of our list of what we want to acquire and and restore and get back into in, into our ownership. I do have to say Umatilla has been very successful and it's all based upon um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs working with us to get property in trust. We have over 10,000 acres that we've done in trust since 2011. Um, but it's a, you know, Chris makes it right. It's a long, ten, long process that's too complicated. A long process and we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you for joining us, Leroy Fairbanks from Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota, Coco Hufford from the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Oregon, and also Chris Stainbrook, president of the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. We'll be right back with a look at how our nation's capital is preparing for next week's inauguration. DC is on high alert following the riot at the US Capitol last week as preparations are being made to inaugurate the 46th President of the United States next week. We take a look around the fortress that's now taking shape. Jordan Bennett Begay is our deputy managing editor and she's based in Washington. She joins us now to give us an idea of what it's like in DC as the nation prepares to welcome a new president and administration. Welcome Jordan. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on. So this inauguration was already going to be different because of the pandemic. And now police are on high alert for any provocations from the president's supporters. What's it like out there today? <laughs> um, the mood, uh, it's funny because I was walking around in downtown DC yesterday, which is kind of where the White House is. Um, and now security is being locked down. Um, roads are being closed and so there's tons of traffic but even you know within the road closures um, there's not that many people walking around it's very it, it's kind of quiet and it's kind of um, you know like almost like a ghost town um, where the road closures are happening um, and uh, as you get closer to the wa White House when I was walking around um, you can see there's probably like a seven foot um, fence being put up that all around the White House um, I mean Lafayette Park which is behind the White House, where a lot of tourists go to you know, get a glimpse of the White House. And that, that whole park is closed off. Nobody can get in there up around the block. Um, and even up the National Mall, I started seeing fences when I was driving around it um, being put up as well, like near the Lincoln uh, Memorial. 
Um, and also I saw photos just like online from other reporters showing that the national mall is being closed off as well too. Um, and from the photos I was looking at, I think NMAI, which is a National American Indian Museum, um, it looks like may, may not be no access to it, but I really wanna check that out. Um, but really there's tons of security around. Um, there's cops, you know, uh, police officers driving up and down streets um, more than usual for sure during this time. Um, signs are being put up uh, where I was parked. You know, they have emergency parking. So some people starting at a certain day won't be able to park in certain areas too. Well, you think about the open nature and what it means for government because tribal leaders like everyone else would go back to events like the inauguration and use it as an opportunity to go visit their tribal, their senators or members of house and uh, lobby for tribal things. Uh, that won't be possible in this environment. Yeah, no, it's very true. I mean, I know when I first came to DC, I was really surprised at how constituents like tribal leaders or even Native people were able to go visit with their congressional members. And now that's not the case, right? And even um, probably the congressional members aren't able to get into their offices because there's such high security now. Um, I know when I was just observing what was going on around the White House, there are security guards who had to like, you know, check in and check out people and let them in, open the gate. Um, and you know, the same is going on with the Capitol too, with the increased security there. And it's, it's gonna make it, I think, a little bit more difficult, um, you know, for constituents, I think, to really express their concerns to their representatives. Well, and for journalists too, I think about all the times I've waited for a congressional hearing and tried to follow a member after to get a question in and that's going to be very difficult if you can't get access to them. Right, right. Well, and that's what I'm kind of really, um, I think, disappointed in just because, you know, when there were Senate meetings, when there was just any type of meeting on the Hill, you know, Colby and I, um, and Colby's our the reporter and producer here, um, he, we were able to go up and down the Hill and just talk and walk around to people. It was just very so open. And now I think people are very on high alert and watching who's walking around them. Even when I was out there walking around, I had to be careful and I'm a journalist, but I can imagine you know, what other citizens are doing, other government workers, they really have to you know, heighten their senses to see what's going on. And that's gonna be the case with um, the inauguration gets closer and the day of the inauguration too, is everybody's senses are gonna be on high alert. Um, Will this make it more difficult to um, for policy changes, or do you think people will just end up using Zoom and the phone like everything else during the pandemic? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think it's going to kind of be a mix of both. I mean, for I, I know just coming to DC, just thinking about tribal leaders, you know, they invest a lot of money in coming here because um, a lot of conferences happen here, a lot of uh, conventions happen here. Um, now it's not going to take, you know, a big buck out of their pocket to visit their representatives and to advocate for certain policies. Um, Zoom may make it possible now for them to meet with their representatives. Um, of course, it's going to take a lot of planning ahead of time because I can imagine um, what the, you know, congressional member schedules are like and having meetings back to back to back. Um, but I do think it's going to make, you know, telling their stories a little bit more difficult. You know, it's one thing to tell a story um, in person and to, to capture that um, the emotion. And now you're doing it over Zoom and there's a screen <laughs> that's kind of, you know, um, the barrier to that. Um, so it might be make it easier. It might um, it might not. I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, make, make it more accessible for sure. Before we run out of time, I want to ask you about something else. Um, the Trump administration was thrown for a loop on the census today where they're not going to be able to segregate uh, the immigrant population. Do you think that'll get the census back on track in terms of reporting to Congress? Um, I don't, I mean, I honestly um, don't know about that. I mean, I wish I knew more. I feel like Right now, the census is already pushed back enough, and there are people in there who really want an accurate count and will, you know, extend the deadline as much as they can to make sure that it's fair. Um, so I can't, wish I could tell more right. <laughs> to you on that. Well, and there are two areas of the census. One is the constitutional requirement for apportionment, but also there's the 
everyday senses for how government operates. And that's something that Congress could invest in and do more of. Uh, it doesn't have to be the, the full count. Yeah, well, that's true. That's right. Oh. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan Benavigay. And uh, that's a slice of our indigenous world today. I'm Mark Trahant. Thank you for watching. We'll be back for another edition tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.